Yes, thank you, Richard. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so we are we are moving now from uh, Germany to Hungary uh, and from the populist challengers to to the incumbents. And uh, my uh, presentation is about uh, how the past is employed by uh, employed for the popular political purposes with uh, the focus on the on the Hungarian case and uh, the Treaty of Trianon. So this presentation is based on the research uh, for my doctoral dissertation at the Charles University and for the fatigue project. And also it is a sort of elaborated and updated form of uh, the paper I presented at the um, ASN annual convention uh, in May, so so let me start. Ooh, I cannot change the slide. One second. All right. Um, so let me start with a little bit of a, a bigger picture. So uh, the phenomenon of uh, Fidesz party and the and the rule of Viktor Orban in Hungary since 2010 um, has been uh, for a couple of years a uh, hotly debated topic, both in academia and uh, in public, uh, with attention maybe beyond uh, the, the um, uh, uh, such countries as Hungary, rather small countries uh, usually get. So there are several explanations of uh, Fidesz phenomenon from various angles. And here are just a couple of examples of uh, concepts that are used uh, to explain uh, this phenomenon, what I will be mm, mm, looking on and where uh, my contribution is uh, hopefully uh, to better understand uh, to better understand it from the cultural political angle by answering sort of two question a more general how the how the difficult past serves as a resource in politics and more precisely how the treaty of Trianon is employed in the memory policies of the Orbán's government and more broadly in its political uh, narratives. So very briefly about the, the theoretical and uh, methodological framework, I adopt an actor-based, moderately instrumentalist approach. Um, obviously, the focus is uh, here on, uh, on the official memory policies. Uh, if you take the concepts conceptualization by Kansteiner, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's mostly the second point. So um, how the memory makers selectively adopt and manipulate the traditions, but I also look at the first and the third point. So what are the, the uh, traditions that frame our representations of the past and, and how it is received by the, by the memory consumer and Obviously, the, um, it has been established in the literature that mnemonic actors are not completely free in this, in this enterprise. And they have to take into account that each audience cultivates a certain vision of the past that it considers valid. Um, so to, um, so uh, the analysis is, is based on various uh, manifestations of the official memory policies. So speeches, political declarations, exhibitions, memorials, videos, etc., etc., uh, which were collected through fieldwork uh, in Hungary, which was a little bit made, made more difficult due to the pandemic. Uh, so, uh, as the, the official commemorations of the centenary moved uh, partly to the online uh, sphere, so as my uh, research. So again, uh, very briefly, you probably all know what Treaty of Trianon was, but just to, to, make, to make sure, so uh, it was part of the post-First World War the settlements, uh, Hungary as part of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, 
uh, found itself on the on the losing side and uh, the treaty uh, sealed in 1920 the loss of two thirds of the territory um, of the country which was multinational and these lands were mostly inhabited by other nationalities but they also included three million of ethnic Hungarians and uh, some of them still live in the in the neighboring countries. So here again, I will not uh, get into detail. Just um, uh, this is a, a sort of a sketchy timeline of how the memory evolved uh, throughout the past uh, 100 years. So, so not going into details uh, with. Uh, various um, periods and various regimes that were in power in in Hungary ruled Hungary uh, the approach changed from the mostly revisionist approach attempting to regain the lands through the sort of um, tabuization of this period to finally in democratic Hungary after 1989 uh, being debated but rather rather having low-key uh, in the public sphere and the revi revisionist ideas um, reserved for, for the far right. It changed in 2010, but I will go back to that. Mm, just a few, um, few data on, on how Trenon Treaty is seen today. So um, by most of the population, it's, uh, it's seen as the greatest tra 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 tragedy in the country's history. However, the society, and uh, according to the polls, is divided in the answers how to address the issue today, with roughly half of the population um, saying that the treaty should, should, should somehow never be accepted, and, and almost half uh, of, the, of the respondents saying that, that it is not relevant today. So in a more, uh, from a more comparative angle, uh, you see the, uh, the results of a Pew Research survey on the right uh, hand side, um, which shows Hungary as the country with, uh, with the biggest number of people agreeing with, uh, with this claim that there are parts of the neighboring countries that really belong to us, although there were some controversies regarding how these questions were translated into into the native countries so all in all it's it's quite difficult to have a full picture of uh, how uh, hungarians see trianon today after 100 years borrowing the concepts of uh, svetlana boim's book on uh, nostalgia uh there are on one hand this more sort of reflective um this sort of reflective approach to to the lost territories and lost uh, sort of country in its in its previous form which which can be like the sentiments to the to the um, to the places where the family come from or to the hungarian heritage that remained outside of the border, but you can also have the sort of restorative nost uh, nostalgia, which emphasize more uh, the or or is manifested in this more um, combative uh, idea of regaining what's lost and 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 regaining the idealized past. But this is roughly how how. Uh, how the uh, Trenon Treaty is seen uh, by this society. So moving to the political part um, uh, and uh, going back to the timeline to the 2010, um, uh, first thing I wanted to emphasize is that the Treaty of Trian Trianon became a sort of bigger, uh, a part of a bigger project of transforming the state and and somehow beginning of the of the new era that was announced by by Fidesz when they when they got into power um, regarding Trianon it immediately got um, got uh, a practical consequences in introducing an official day of remembrance on 4th of June so the day when the treaty was signed 
distributing citizenship, voting rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the general sense uh, was to, uh, or the general idea of the uh, of the uh, ruling party to somehow demonstrate agency and and show a sense of uh, rupture with the post 1989 liberal order in the country. However, um, it doesn't mean that the Fidesz government somehow excavated the, the, the interwar revisionist uh, ideas, and at, at least not in their entirety. Um, instead, it rather navigated between various expectations, opportunities, and constraints, uh, and calibrated the memory policies to various political narratives uh, of the moment. So, so now uh, I would like to show uh, three uh, sort of main uh, framings of Trianon that could be identified, uh, that I ad identified through a systematic analysis of the centenary commemorations. And I will go uh, one by one now. So, um, uh, first one is a sort of tra traditional idea of uh, Tariano as tragedy, victimhood, and uh, injustice. So during the centenary year, it was um, emphasized the, the, the uniqueness of the Hungarian tra tra tragedy, uh, quoting Viktor Orban the verdict in Triano was obviously a death sentence. History has not recorded a nation that could survive such a loss of blood. Uh, it was also uh, mm, mm, inscribed into a sort of chain of Hungarian victimhood, uh, drawing a link between uh, Tariano and, and other dramatic events from Hungarian history as as Gabor Egri emphasized, uh, suffering became the common thread of national history here. And a good example of that is, uh, is, the, um, is the Memorial of National Unity, which you can see uh, on the picture I took on the, during the opening of the, of the memorial last year. So uh, this is uh, the first memorial opened, uh, well, first state-funded uh, uh, memorial of Trianon since, uh, since the Second World War. Um, um, and it's, uh, um, it was erected in front of the, of the Hungarian parliament in Budapest. So it's a large underground uh, stone ramp and it very much has the symbolic of a tomb. So, so uh, it, has the, it has the tables with the names of towns of uh, about 20, uh, uh, 12,000 towns both uh, currently in Hungary and, and outside, so all the towns of pre-Triano Hungary, which reminds the um, commemorative plates of the deceased. It has eternal flame, again, uh, a symbol linked to the, to the tombs in the European uh, culture and the soil from 64 countries, which can be seen as the ashes of the dead body of the greater Hungary. Uh, again, another important element was this, the, the emphasis on the injustice that the Treaty of Triano is asso associated with. So the hubris, arrogance, or, and short-sightedness of the victors of the First World War, which dictated the borders without consider, uh, considering the will of the people. So in the official discourse uh, and in the public media, the treaty is usually called a diktat. So who are the, uh, the perpetrators of the injustice? Uh, these were interestingly um, in Fidesz rhetoric, not so much the neighboring uh, nations which took the the lands that were previously Hungarian, but the focus is on the guilt of the Western Empire. So here, France, uh, Great Britain, or uh, United States are, are mentioned. And in the speech, uh, in the main um, centenary speech of Orban, uh, uh, he said, I quote, the West raped the thousand years old uh, borders and history of uh, Central Europe. 
However, this uh, sort of traditional uh, sort of pessimistic narrative was not the only one uh, which could be identified in the uh, in the last year's um, centenary. And the one I will be uh, talking about now, it's, um, it's, it, it's something more of a novelty uh, when, when you look at the, at the past 100 years. So, so it's about seeing uh, Tariano as a source of strength and perseverance for maybe not the treaty itself, but especially the ensuing 100 years. So as Orban emphasized in one of his uh, commemorative speeches, there is no other nation of the world that could have endured such a period of 100 years. So here it's, uh, it's a part of a larger trend in, uh, in Central European politics uh, that uh, the sort of traditional narratives of uh, grievance and injustice are complemented with a sense of optimism uh, in order to insert a self-confidence into the otherwise gloomy traditional mentality, as Jolt Einidi uh, argues. Uh, so in this vein, the Triano Memorial that uh, we discussed already uh, can be inter interpreted uh, in a different way, other than only as a sort of uh, pomp of the, the Greater Hungary. The authors themselves suggested that um, that um, that it can have uh, a cathartic um, uh, feeling to the visitors who first descend to the tomb, indeed, but then circle around in the darkness around the granite structure with the eternal flame and its lowest point to finally return upward to see the light again and uh, emerging contours of the monumental building of the parliament, so the symbol of Hungarian strength. You can see it uh, on the picture uh, in the upper uh, right side. So in this sense, there is this change from the more gloomy uh, outlook to a more optimistic, right? And finally, uh, here, there is this sort of remedy for Trianon that the government is uh, talking about. So it can be uh, seen in the, in the concept of the national unity beyond the borders. So the idea proposed or promoted by Fidesz since 2010, and especially in the last year, which was called the year of national unity. So the idea that all the Hungarians that are both uh, in the country and on the territories that have been lost, uh, are um, are united, so uh, a notion of a virtual reintegration uh, of of the nation, which has also practical consequences um, in terms of citizenship and voting rights. And finally, the third one is the one again the traditional revisionist. Um, um, uh, narrative, which which was last year uh, intertwined with the more reconciliatory uh, rhetoric by the government. So, just a couple of examples how these sort of interwar symbols um, appeared uh, during the last year's centenary. So, these were mostly the maps and contours of the of the. All right, noted. Um, of the uh, of the greater uh, Hungary, you can see them on all the three pictures. On the upper right side, you see the uh, meeting of the Fidesz party executives with uh, Orban on the left, with the uh, map of greater Hungary in the background, which was uploaded on social media uh, by uh, Viktor Orban. Um, so these maps that, of course, in itself do not uh, necessarily mean uh, um, revisionist messages, but if they are employed by the, by the executives, it's, it's, it brought quite a lot of controversies uh, in the neighboring countries. 
you had the mainstreaming of the far right revisionist figures such as Erno Rafai in the lower uh, right side, again, against the background of the Greater Hungary, uh, who actually is sort of a leading revisionist activist um, who got employed recently in the uh, state-funded institute and uh, received awards from the president, state awards. And another example are the conspiracy theories about Tataria known that were um, quite present in the, in the um, right-wing pro-government press. So um, finally, the allusions to the irredentist slo slogans that appeared also in Orban speeches. Um, however, all these sort of allusions to the um, revisionist ideas were complemented by the, by the concept of Central European cooperation emphasized. So um, Hungarian politicians or the, the government politicians were emphasizing that while in the past we have the hostile neighborhood, now we have a thriving region. And as Orban put it, the, uh, the biggest achievement is that we put an end to the 100 years of uh, solitude. So uh, just a couple of just a couple of conclusion. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, all in all, uh, the the Orban government approach to Tariano has been a, quite a proactive during last year. Uh, but in the same time, it was extremely thematically eclectic, at times contradictory, as I uh, hopefully demonstrated with these three uh, uh, different uh, narratives. And uh, this case also demonstrates that the right-wing populist in power does not simply adopt the nationalist narratives about the past, but they calibrate their message in various ways. Uh, through different strategies such as calculated ambiguity or dog whistle and, and others. And uh, obviously the, the main driver here is the response to the popular sentiments that are still persisting in the, in the society around uh, uh, the issue of Triano. So the government in this way shows agency and the sense of direction by exploring uh, the topic earlier mar uh, marginalized by the, main, by the mainstream and offers uh, new interpretations and even if only apparent remedies, even if, of course, uh, some of the issues are not so straightforward and somehow uh, formulated as uh, allusion, allusions. Right? So finally, um, uh, let me conclude by saying that Hungary remains a fractured memory regime using the term from the comparative research on, um, on memory uh, politics in the region. Uh, while Fidesz enforced its memory policies, it did so with no public consultation, with scarce public debate. Well, the, the public debate actually on the centenary was quite vivid, but only um, only um, in the in the media independent from the ruling party. So uh, so uh, in this way, um, even if if um, even if some of these uh, narratives can have some productive also element to it. All in all, uh, they are uh, sort of uh, from top to the bottom, so it raises doubts whether uh, whether uh, they will remain in place in some time. So I will end here. Thank you, and I'm looking for for the questions later. Thanks. <laughs>